How We Make Movies is brought to you by Microsoft Surface, Assimilate, Azo and AJA, Moviola, and Canon Hollywood. Welcome back to How We Make Movies. I'm your host, Amanda Lippert, and today's guests are the father-son team behind a new short silent film called The Moving Picture Company 1914, which is currently up for Academy consideration. The film takes us back 100 years ago to a long-forgotten movie studio where an aspiring actress uh, seeks out her lucky break and everything goes wrong. The film's writer-director, Mark Kirkland, is three-time Emmy award-winning director of The Simpsons. His father, Douglas Kirkland, has worked as a photographer and documentary filmmaker, uh, covering behind the scenes on over 100 motion pictures. And he's photographed Marilyn Monroe, Elizabeth Taylor, and Marlon Dietrich, just to name a few. Um, and he also, in this film, did the behind the scenes and made his on-camera debut. Please give a warm welcome to Douglas and Mark Kirkland. Thank you so much for joining us today, guys. So tell me a little bit about your film. Um, I, you really described it beautifully. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. It's a labor of love, mm -hmm. uh, 22 minutes long. Yeah. It's a silent movie, and it's a silent movie about uh, people making silent movies 100 years ago. It's very meta. Yeah, meta. <laughs> it was shot in my backyard. <laughs> so that's another that's pretty thing. Pretty cool. So, um, what, how did this film come about? Well, I am a filmmaker, and I go back to making. Uh, it, it really goes back to my dad here, uh, being a photographer and a filmmaker. Uh, I really was raised in uh, working in the business before I knew it, because he was taking pictures of me as a small child and selling them. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm old. <laughs> but uh, by the time I was 12, 13 years old. Uh, he started taking me on sets, mm -hmm. and I would carry luggage, and he taught me to clean lenses. got very lenses. long arms. Yeah, I got the long arms. <laughs> um, but I got to experience um, watching um, my dad at work as a uh, documentary filmmaker, and I got to see when we went to, we were doing behind the scenes of big movies, I got to see big movies being made. Along the way, though, he purchased me a uh, Super 8 camera. How old were you when you got your first camera? 13, I'm going to say 13, but uh, I, watched, I watched them, yeah, we go into a camera <laughs> store in New York and I watched them haggle for about a half an hour to get the price down, and, and so I got my camera, but we walked out and, I, and he told me, there's a lesson, never pay full price for a camera. So, <laughs> uh, but so I, my first lesson in filmmaking. That era of camera, Super 8 camera is what I had did not have a sound function, so I had to make silent movies. And I started studying silent movies when I was 13, 14 years old, and that, and that made Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Laurel and Hardy, who made many silent films, Laura, Harold Lloyd. And I started doing reenactment and period things, finding stuff from junk shops and, you know, not swap meets, but auctions yeah. and things like that. Just cheap stuff yeah. and my friends and I would shoot things in backyards, garages, wherever we could. And then I would splice them and I would try to learn from how you to make these kind of movies. actually edited your oh, yeah. early films? Did yes. you do presentations for your friends and families and neighbors? That's as big as it got. The, the <laughs> venue was friends and family, yes. I so. remember listening to an interview um, with Steven Spielberg. I think it was mm. on uh, Inside the Actor's Studio and he talked about at eight years old, making mm -hmm. his first film, and you know, screening it, and for all the neighbors, and charging twenty-five cents. He had the early distribution model down. Like he was making yeah. money off of yeah. even at eight years old. Figured that it was a business early on. Can you talk about what it was like to have your son on set with you, and some of the movies that you guys worked on, and maybe what you were trying to teach him? Uh, he wanted to be with me. We were in places like in Kenya and Africa. Before that, we were here in Los Angeles, and we were with uh, Sammy Davis Jr. I was doing a, a documentary on Here we are in Africa. Yeah. That's that my wife, Francoise, yeah. on the left. <laughs> Mark in the middle. Yeah. And uh, an Eclair. Um, Camel, Camel. NPR. There I, there I am. At, I think I'm 13 or 14 at most. I can tell you, you see those collages behind mm -hmm. the, on the wall? Yeah. 
those opened up and Sammy Davis Jr. had one of the largest private film collections in the world and those were projection ports behind wow. those. And he, Mark is he holding a slate there. Yeah, I'm holding the way. a tiny slate. And that's my dad on the far left with the uh, Eclair uh, NPR. NPR yeah. And that's Francoise, our, my stepmother, and holding a shotgun, a Sennheiser shotgun right 805. there. 805. Yeah. Wow. But uh, there, there we are back in and the Sammy day. And Sammy was a wonderful, so. wonderful, incredible yeah. human being. Yeah. If you knew him, you would have loved him. I guarantee you. That's incredible. So that must have, um, that obviously was very influential on you becoming a filmmaker. By this summer, I was thinking, I, I want to make films somehow my livelihood. Yeah. Already at that stage. Yeah. But, you know, I had, I was lucky and... I was exposed, and um, I was happy to be there and see all this. Yeah. You were also We're experimenting with all sorts of things at home. Mark put costumes together. He made mm -hmm. a gorilla costume for yeah. one of his films that he could, somebody could wear. <laughs> and I, may, I never knew a kid who built himself a, a gorilla costume. And uh, there were other things as well. He was very inventive with his hands. And he, he always wanted to go to the, the destination of what his where his imagination took him. What were some of the furthest places your imagination took you in your early films? Well, relating to this one was making silent movies yeah. and, and pretending like I was making a Laurel and Hardy movie and things yeah. like that. I wanted to create laughter mm -hmm. and... Um, that's been kind of a consistent theme for me in my life, yeah. I think, and I've ended up with a job doing that. Yeah, for and the last 25 yeah. years, you've yeah. been making a lot of people laugh. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> Mark is you. a director of The yeah. Simpsons, yeah. 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 television show for the last 25 years. He's made more Simpsons shows than any other director, approaching 80 today, and he's won three Emmys. And proud uh, dad. so I'm <laughs> kind of proud of him. I think we can understand yeah. that. You deserve He's that. Done very well. Speaking of, you know, going to far places with your imagination, this mm -hmm. film takes us a hundred years mm -hmm. in the past, mm -hmm. uh, back to that time, kind of rediscovering your early roots in filmmaking. Can you talk about the significance of the title yeah. of this film? Well, as you say, it's a hundred years ago, and. Also, a hundred years ago, when I was, I was there was a there was a period of like shaping the idea, and I want to bring in to the story my wife Letty, who mm -hmm. has supported me, and she's not in the industry, but she said to me, "You should be making films," and um, I said, "If in you, addition to your day in, job, yeah," and I said, "Well, will you produce them?" And she said, "I don't know anything about that." I said, "Well." I'll help you produce them if you if you if you'll support and help me do this. So, it's really valuable to have someone reading your ideas. And so, while we were making dinner, or having a glass of wine, or something, I would either tell her ideas. But I started writing down six-page scripts mm -hmm. and reading. And she was my reader. She bounced a couple of ideas, but she liked this one and said, "I want this one to grow a little more." And she is a good reader. Mm -hmm. She loves reading books and she likes watching TV shows and going to movies. So she used her gut of what she likes. And so I, it took me over a year to conceive this story. But I was into collecting these antique movie cameras mm -hmm. and I was reading about the people who use them for fun. Yeah. And uh, it took me a while, but eventually there's, I started writing Haskell about Wexler it. There's Haskell Wexler in yeah. one right there. But I... Um, basically decided on this date and time because I could get these cameras in and display them in use. And mm -hmm. I, I discovered 1914 was a really kind of significant year in motion picture because, number one, it was the first year Charlie Chaplin wore his tramp outfit yeah. and changed the world of cinema. It was also a period of time when cinema itself was going through, it was becoming... It was moving from low-brow entertainment, cheap entertainment, to high-brow, high brow, and even people were starting to use the word art. And so I thought <laughs> a year later, you know, uh, features started being clicking with the public, mm -hmm. and they, they went from shorts to features. Now, this is a short, but um, 
I, you know, I, I wove into the story all the sort of archetypes. Now, it also opens a little, a little bit of humor on Star Wars, you know, far, far away opening uh, yeah, title. Yeah, the opening but title. But it's a long forgotten movie studio, which gives me a lot of room to, to create. But mm -hmm. it's also factual in that most of our silent movie history today is lost and forgotten. Yeah. You know? A lot of it was destroyed. There are many, many people who worked in the industry we don't know about. As a young man first coming to California, I met some of these people, including a boss who we have in our movie. The junk and that was dealer? Through my, yeah, the junk yeah. dealer, through my dad, when he photographed Hal Roach, who was the man who put Laurel and Hardy together, the Our Gang Little Rascals kids. Mm -hmm. He, put, he, he produced Harold Lloyd's films, but I met him when he was 100 years old. Wow. And I met... Uh, he had two hearing aids. Yeah. <laughs> but he started in the business in 1912. Some of these pictures of my dad's, who was so... I was so lucky and uh, fortunate to have him. He joined me and volunteered his time. One of the great photographers, really, of all time, but he's certainly done more behind the scenes of the best behind the scenes photographs of important movies like... Uh, it's Charlie Chaplin, by the yeah. way, working. He's covered Stanley Kubrick's 2001. He's covered Sound of Music, Titanic, uh, Great Gatsby. But So he comes and spends three days on our set. That on must our, have been a real backyard. treat. What was it so, like to work with your son again after all these years? Very special. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing. Uh, there we are together with Haskell. With Haskell Wexler. Yeah, the Another is. real legend, by the way. He's, yeah, he's a great yeah. individual. We all love him. He's in his early 90s now. And he's <laughs> still cutting up, just as always. And he was there for Mark 100%. Mark and yeah. Haskell are very, very close. Now, well, was Haskell yeah. actually using that camera? Yeah. Or using that The one you see in the picture now, it's called a Camaflex. In uh -huh. fact, it's right here. This is, this oh, is, this is, yay, this yeah, is the fun yeah, part. Yeah. This is, um, with the toys. some of the movie, okay, how we shot the movie is another matter. Yeah. I initially <laughs> conceived of it all being shot when it was six pages. I wanted to shoot everything with a hand crank camera and with film. So you wanted to do the whole movie everything. in film. Okay. And then as it grew in length up to a 22 page script. Yeah. Um, That's I actually, when Canon came in. Well, uh -huh. yes. Uh, and I also pulled in a friend of mine who is, became my DP, and he's a talented cinematographer, very knowledgeable with digital cinematography, mm -hmm. and we use the Canon 5D Mark II for the, a lot of our movie. Mm -hmm. And I just say thank God for that camera because we were allowed to do improvisation and take after take. I, used, I ended up using true film uh, both 35 millimeter and 16. This is another old friend of mine. Wow. For How long have you had this camera? I, I have had a camera similar to this one, and then this one really, like since I was 18. Wow. And then this is combined with some really, like that's a 90-year-old uncoated lens with an iris on it. So some of the iris effects and the early uncoated film look were either done with this camera or yeah. this because the key, the secret to this camera is I had modified, I took a hundred year old lens and I had it mounted I, and it goes here. I can see through the lens with this yeah. and then I have a hand crank. So I really have everything that they were using a hundred years ago. And then the other camera we used was this one over here. It's and another demonstration. Yeah, which and I can you give see you. that one a lot in the film too, that, on those yeah. legs. That there's a shot in our movie of Al Yankovic playing the accordion, and it was done with that camera. <laughs> Key to all of this is our lab, Photochem. Uh, and oh, by the way, Haskell, yes, he not only acts in the movie, but we set this camera up which was his favorite throughout his career, and he shot a lot of the action scenes himself with this camera. So I had... So he was familiar with the camera oh, yeah. and knew it well. He knew it so That's well. It's incredible that you were able to find a DP that had yeah. so much experience with a 100-year-old camera. Oh, this is not a 100-year-old oh, camera. Oh, how old is this camera? This camera's like a 60-year-old camera. Oh, okay. So it's still, but the but there's a 100-year-old okay. lens on it. Got it. So Haskell volunteered, and I, when he told me, I want to work with you, I was like, wow. Now... I had to figure out how do I work with that? It's what like what do I do? Picasso yeah. saying, I want to work with you. So <laughs> that's really what it is. I decided, both in my dad, too, is in the movie, I decided 
to make them play their counterparts but a hundred years ago. Yeah. Now, you, have you so. ever been in front of the camera before? Very rarely, once or twice uh, in, in... This is the, your first acting role. This is my first yeah. true <laughs> acting role. And did, and, did he have to convince you to say yes? He, well, he, uh, I, I always want to help, but he had, he told me how I had to dress yeah. and uh, <laughs> act. And you know what I was yelling when I I have a you'll you'll see it in the movie. I'm I come out from under my camera under my focusing cloth. And I'm yelling, "You can't do this! I'm an artist." <laughs> <laughs> that was my Another. those are my that was <laughs> silent, but that's what I was saying. Also, you, what happened? Let me just say, interject. Um, he saw how much fun Haskell was having, yeah. and he wanted to play too. That was Absolutely. that's, we, and that's was, what it's all about. It that's really why cool was players. the fun of all this. It's hard work. All anybody here who's a filmmaker, all of you filmmakers know, it's hard work. Yeah. But you you kind of cross over an endorphin kick in that feels like you're a kid again and playing with your friends in the backyard. I think it's that, something really I should mention here, however, if you, I may. Yeah. Remember, Mark is working five days a week and having to report for duty in the morning and often working till six or seven in the evening. And then he gets on to writing all this and, and shooting on weekends and building a set. So what he did is he not only had conceived of this, but he wrote the script, he did the casting, stop me at any point if Luckily I'm Luckily I had to have people helping me yeah. here. Yeah, with but the he also yeah. then, uh, constructed the sets. I've never heard of a filmmaker building his own sets in his backyard and uh, so they could be moved around uh, and changed and uh, it was a quite extraordinary. This is a one-man well, ship in terms I of I pulled in people. Let me show you. That, that, I, that I'll have to say, it was a team job. If you look at that photograph too, you see quite a bit of people in it. We had good people. You'll notice too in that picture the silk overhead. Everything was shot outdoors, with the exception of the makeup room, which was in the garage. But the silk overheads were how they shot silent movies 100 years ago. 100 years ago in Los Angeles, they were doing something just like this. So we, I tried to create the environment back in my area. It was a private area near my garage and driveway. I tried to create an environment wherever you would look, it looked like you were back in time. And you'll see I'm wearing a director's outfit 100 years ago because I, I was jumping in and out of scenes as an extra. And I discovered, wow, my actors are, have let down their guard completely because I look as crazy as they do. And, <laughs> and so I started getting in scenes a little more and finally ended up playing the role of the director. But I, I immersed so myself in the everybody, and, and there's Clyde Smith, who he came in as a special uh, contributing cinematographer, and he's worked with Al Yankovic on most of Al's. Videos. Should mention, yeah, Al yeah. Was, is well, in yeah, yeah. He's very central. Because we're getting on the casting, yeah. um, you know, I noticed that a lot of the actors were playing double roles, yeah. and a lot of your crew were also your actors, yeah. and then you got this really special guest to kind of make an appearance in yeah. the middle of the movie. How did, how did he get involved? Al and I go back professionally on The Simpsons, and um, I had done a favor for him, and uh, I had shown him my last film, which he liked and was moved by it. It's a World War II story, very serious, and he told me very his father different. was in the Second World War. Yeah. It's a drama. And uh, we were doing, uh, we were meeting at a coffee shop, and I was showing him this silent movie project I was working on. As I wrote the script, that's like a two, three line piece of business in the script, and I played a mental game, which is, I'm sure a lot of people do this, if I could cast anyone in the world, who would it be? Just for, be ideal about it, and then you work your way to, like, well, this person kind of looks like this person, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I, a, a lightning flash hit me, Al Yankovic, and then and the second thing was, wait a second, I know him. And so I emailed him and said, <laughs> would you be in my silent movie? And I got a quick, yes, I will be. Because he had faith in what I was doing. Then I had the delicate job to explain to him who he would play. <laughs> um, By the way, there was a movie apparently made back then yeah. with The Last Supper in it. And you didn't it, just invent it for this film. I, to help sell him on the idea, I told him it's researched. And I sent him a photograph of a scene from 1914 like that. And, and then another big sales point to him 
was pulling in a DP he trusted, who was Clyde Smith. Mm. And Clyde, when he heard through the grapevine I was working with Al, he called me up. And we were old college friends. And he says, can I help you in any way? And I said, sure, I could use a hand. And, and so building that team, and that's really what a movie like this is. It's, it's, it's about assembling a really good team of people. And this concept, I was really delighted to say that people would hear it and say, I want to do that. It sounds yeah. like fun. It does it, sound it like was fun. fun. It was hard work, but it was really fun. So, How many weekends did it take to shoot the movie? I think we shot, and I mean from B-roll, insides of cameras, to main big scenes. It probably took over a year to collect. Whoa. But I was shooting and processing film, and I want to throw in a really valuable player in all this was Photocam Industries. Um, they are uh, our, our finest lab today working with film, and they they're completely digital and doing major feature work with digital equipment, but they still honor the time-tested film, and they're the last lab out here really dealing in a major bulk with film. And uh, the, uh, the president, Bill Broderson, uh, helped me when I really was, they, the photo came, became the seventh cavalry when I had to pull all this together, and they were transferring film elements and Everything goes on to a DI today. Mm -hmm. So I was able digital to take intermediate. Yeah, I was able to take 16 millimeter, 35, and digital, mm -hmm. and I was able to blend it. And when we were done, I sat with uh, Bill Broderson and other Mike Broderson, and we sat together and we watched some of the film, and I would have to tell them that's digital, that's film. And they, you know, they run the lab and they couldn't tell. Wow. So that's amazing. I just yeah. want to show, here's a, an yeah. image here that really shows the, the, the family atmosphere. I mean, yeah. here I am. Dad's uh, birthday. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my August 16, my birthday. And what they, the whole cast did is they were working all day. And toward the end of the day, they gave me a surprise party. And I had no idea. And so there we are. And uh, one candle on the cake, but anyway, it was a candle. <laughs> Who's uh, counting? But that's it was so fun, and, and yeah. everybody, I just saw a mirror there, and I said, hey, wait, let me get a picture of all of us. And that's the way we had fun. Yeah. Photography yeah. and filmmaking can be fun. A lot of hard work, mm -hmm. yes, but it really, it's why Mark wants uh -huh. to do it, it's why I want to do it. Yeah. And, yeah. Canon has been very important to me, by the way. I shoot with all Canon cameras. I have been for, for many years. Uh, Do you have a favorite camera better. that you shoot with? I shoot with a 5D Mark III predominantly. I've worked with different other cameras, but I also have a little tiny pocket camera I keep with me at just about all times. This is an S100, they, the latest is an S300. I'll just show you how easy it can be. I, Oh, there, 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 there you all are. Yeah. Douglas Kirkland took your picture today. <laughs> you just got your picture taken by a famous photographer. Now, how do you feel about that? Do you guys want to see the trailer? We haven't even seen the trailer yet. We're okay, let's watch the trailer.
idea of yeah. you know what we're talking about here. You got started as a kid, and you probably felt like a kid in a candy store in your backyard. Can you talk about the set that you built? How many rooms? Sure. How many walls? How long did it take to build a set? Well, that sounds pretty intricate. I am very fortunate. I have a contractor living next door to me. And <laughs> I, he would come over when they were slow with three guys, two or three guys, and I got to be friends with all of them, and I would hang out with them and contribute, and I had a bulletin board of pictures from the Silent Arrow <laughs> Studios, and I would often go over and I did some drawing, but mostly pointing at pictures, and they, they would start building what we needed. And most of our stage was a 12 foot by 12 foot stage. And it had flats that would go up. Mm -hmm. And we were able to use a silk that was 12 feet by 12 feet overhead. And we worked with sunlight as our principal light source, mm -hmm. which was accurate to the silent movie era. We would reset that stage between weekend shooting to be a completely different set. And we would just mix it up. And we had one piece of one building made in, in the back driveway area that we made it look like the front of it looked like the production office. Mm -hmm. And then when we were finished shooting, all the sets, all the flats collapsed up and were stored in there and our costumes were stored in there. So it, it became this kit, a toy that we would take everything out and reset it whenever we wanted to. Along the way, while taking our evening walks, we'd see a desk on the street being thrown out. We'd grab that desk. Uh, there's one scene that looks like a saloon, and it's got rustic wood. That wood came from a house that was being demolished, and we grabbed the truck and drove everything over. So a lot of things were found yeah. in the movie. But if you take your time, that you can find things like that. All the costumes were from thrift stores. and. Mm -hmm. I built what I needed to build, you know, prop-wise in the movie. Uh, we used these actual hand crank movie cameras, which were really the inspiration of it. Uh, I'm holding a megaphone in there, and, and that was purchased. A lot of things were purchased off eBay, mm -hmm. and they'd have to be restored or repainted. Um, I asked Al Yankovic to bring his accordion, which only shows up in the titles, but I thought it would be a humorous uh, prop. He's it, funny he's even so without identified. trying. He contributed yeah. so he's much, amazing. and he really got into this yeah. a great deal, and he was a great contributor. Would you not say uh, that, Mark? Yeah. I, he, may, he really uh, helped us. It, even if he just was so special how he pulled it off. And when he came, we began every morning with uh, a table read mm -hmm. with our actors once we were in costume. Then we would look at the previous week's dailies. And he was focused in like a laser studying our style of humor. And so when he was on camera, he nailed it. And, um, but that's a pro. You know, he's yeah. a pro. And I think uh, I couldn't have... I couldn't have picked anyone better in the universe to play what he played or how he played it. Now, this is an interesting point. What I did is not only cover the, f the shooting of the film and behind the scenes and everything, but I wanted to do portraits of people like Al here. And I used a 70-200, uh, 28 wide open, and just uh, a single LED light on him. and. Uh, and he did the rest. And uh, but having this sort of material as promotional device oh. is very important. We're using Dad's photographs. Um, we're build We have a website. We're we're still constructing our poster graphics. By my dear friend uh, Phil Hatton was able to take your pictures into a fabulous poster piece of key art is so important. It's, it's, I, I say, even as a filmmaker, your hardest single image of your movie is your poster. Wow. And you have to think like a movie promoter. If you, don't have a good promo, if you don't have a good poster and a good trailer, how do you get people to see your movie? So it, it, it's a tough job. But Mark has been getting awards, and this poster's getting filled up with all these we, different awards and different uh, floral leaves places he's <laughs> He's been, uh, yeah. his film has been shown, including in Europe and in, in, uh, Bologna, the film now? festival, and, and many other places. We're, we've been out, we premiered about six months ago, and we're now heading in, we, we really averaged a festival a month, so we're six festivals for six months, nice. and a couple more to go, yeah. and 
Uh, and then, you know, the trick is for Letty and I, even though we still are maintaining our jobs, is to keep finding festivals that we want to be in and treat, keep putting that out. Yeah. It, you know, your, your, your job isn't done once you make the movie. It can go on for years after just trying to promote years. it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, you mentioned humor before. One of the things that I loved about the movie, because I got to see the whole thing, was um, the way you use the cameras to portray humor as well. And I just noticed that there were so many old uh, tricks and gags that I hadn't seen in a long time, and some of them are still used today. Uh, and have just kind of evolved, uh, you know, with the art of filmmaking. And can you talk about some of the specific things that you did to let the camera be the one telling the joke? Can you give me an example? Yeah, my favorite yeah. was um, when the the tramp character oh, yeah. was uh, walking by the wardrobe department, yeah. and he sees the girl in her slip, and um, you know he's like oogling her with his eyes, and he turns away for a second and turns back, and then there's the crazy old lady, yeah. and that exact gag was used in There's Something About Mary, oh, okay. when the guy was in the car and he was spying on Mary in her bedroom window, and then her roommate, the haggy old lady, like kind of like gets into the frame and like shows her boobs and scares him. And I just like thought that was really funny that like after all these years it still works every time. I would say that first of all I had a script uh -huh. and I worked the for looking for humorous situations yeah. and feedback and working on that script for about a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, Letty being my principal reader and then finally other people um, and that's when we decided okay it's ready to move ahead. That scene you mentioned was not in the script, but an ad lib that I had come up with later. Mm -hmm. And it replaced a dull scene. And so the, even though you have a, a safety net of a script in comedy, I especially feel when you have your locations, your settings, and your actors. The way Stan Laurel worked in Charlie Chaplin, they would get on set and find what they called shtick. Yeah. You know? and they would work a piece of business, and that's what we were doing. And me as a director, and you're talking about camera work, on, in my work in animation, we're very specific about framing and what point of view things are. And what you described was using point of view shots mm -hmm. through his looking through the window, and then finally for shock value, yeah. when he sees the woman in the window, <laughs> It's, it's definitely directly his point of view and then flip back. And I think that's the most direct way of telling the story. But uh, humor, we, you know, a lot of humor is based on surprise, the element of surprise, things jumping out at you. And there's a lot of that in this movie, things that surprise you. And another one is uh, when the boss thinks he's found his, act, his new leading lady. And, you know, beautiful wig. It turns around, and, and it's a, a real rough-looking guy. Yeah. That that's a, a surprise, and mm -hmm. it jumps out at you. So, and you talk about shtick. Um, how did you find your Charlie Chaplin mm. uh, character? He was as much as I could. I wrote for people, which I think is a really good idea for all filmmakers too. Um, mm. He is my wife's nephew, Adam. He's mm -hmm. a dyed-in-the-wool actor, and he had honed up and really knew Charlie Chaplin every film he had. He was the last character I wrote into the storyline. and But once I wrote him in, I said he would be perfect for playing this role. He's the right age. Because mm -hmm. when Chaplin and Mary Pickford were working, they were very young. I mean, Mary Pickford was maybe 15, 16. Uh, and she worked into her 30s playing young girls yeah. in, in the movies. But um, uh, Adam was 21 when he did the film, and Jen, our lead actress, was was uh, tw 20 wow. when, she, when she did it. So, Just to say something about yeah. Charlie Chaplin and also Mary Pickford, uh, in the books it's stated, and I, I wasn't around then, but that they were the two best-known human beings in the world, yeah. universally, because films were suddenly in the 14, 1914 going everywhere. Yeah. And the world became aware of their image. And uh, there were other actors and actresses, but those two people were known if you could be in, in some obscure country and they would know them. Here I am with Mary. She's, she's from Toronto, like I am. And, and this was a joke we were singing, God save the king, I think, or the queen or something like that. 
and uh, just playing around. And uh, I was with Mary. Uh, I worked with her on a story that I was doing for Look Magazine. I also worked on, with Charlie Chaplin on his last movie in London, which was called, called Countess of Hong Kong, or From Hong Kong. And uh, here I was for three weeks with Charlie Chaplin. Now, just imagine if you were given an assignment like that. You say, my god, is he still alive? That was the first thing I asked, because <laughs> by then, the year was uh, 1960, and he had been around for uh, quite a while. And uh, But look at this man. He, he was making his last movie, but he, put, he cared. He had such passion. And I think that's what a lot of people, like Mark and others here, and probably in this very room, feel about the world of filmmaking. It's, it has an excitement about it. And this is Chaplin, and he became many different people at different times. It's so interesting to see him in that picture as a director, because mm -hmm. I always imagine him as the actor. Mm -hmm. That's right. I never think of him he as He also the wrote music. Yeah. He wrote a wonderful music, uh, some, some beautiful music that he had in his films. And uh, uh, so he was a multi-talented individual. And um, I, I knew him. I spent time with him on the set for three weeks, and then I would meet him in different places in Europe. I would be doing different stories in Italy and other places, and he'd be sitting at a table over there. I'd go over and he's, I'd talk with he and his wife. And this was like a year or two later, and they remembered me, and they were very kind and outgoing. And uh, it was a nice feeling. But uh, this is Mark's day. Yeah. He's the hero here, not Doug Kirkland. You know, anyway. I've had... Um best friends on here. I've had um, sisters on here. I've never had a father-son huh. team. And I, I really just have to say how much I love the dynamic. And, you know, I can tell that you're so proud of him, but so much... I am much exceedingly proud yeah. of him, Mark. Well, likewise. He's kind yeah. of, you know Absolutely. what he did? I want to tell you a couple of Mark, <laughs> Mark stories tell if us. I may. Because he won't tell them. Okay, when he was, he was making, trying, wanted to get into animation. So I, I, we lived in the New York area at the time, and I, I knew a lot of people in the business, so I, I took him to some of my friends to see if I could get him a summer job. Uh, I think he was 13 or 14, uh, in New York, in the animation field, because that was what he wanted to be in. And we went to a couple of people, and, but one of them I vividly remember, he said, oh, kid, there's no future in animation. It's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Just give it up. It's all live action today. Don't don't think of animation. He said, "No, I want to do it." And so then we came out here to Cal Arts. I have have never worked California. here. California. <laughs> we came out here to California to Cal Arts, which is California Arts Institute, a great school for animation, endowed by Disney, and uh, we went in and sweet talked the nice lady who was in charge of enrollment. And he was a, a year or two early. He was 17 at the time. He had to be 18 to get in there. But he had a pretty hot portfolio. And they took him. So in the four years he was at CalArts, he, among other things, he won a, a student Oscar for a film he did. Oh. That was his first one. <laughs> anyway, and then the Emmys followed that. I mean, how could you not be proud of oh, your son? Like that? I love that. I mean, and, and then, the, 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 here's the funny thing. So he had four years to put in at CalArts, and he made the most of it, because it was not just uh, only animation. It was a film school, and he was also doing animation. So he was getting live action as well as animation, the history of cinema, all sorts of things like that. Very enriching. Uh, but what happened is suddenly a lot of animation came back. The, the Flintstones arrived. And what happened is a lot of the, the old filmmakers in animation were no longer around because they'd come in in the 30s with, with Disney. And they had, were out of, out of the business. There was a shortage of animators. So, he had to leave school a couple months early. They did graduate him to work on the Flintstones because it was a shortage of animators. So that was like 
that makes me feel so excited for him. And oh, it's the pride I feel in him. Oh, and I, I think that's a big part of your story too, like that you have followed your heart and you do what you want to do and what you're interested in. And it kind of has worked out for you in other Mark ways too. Mark has a capability of doing whatever he wants to do. I love that. And with this film, I mean, it was a silent film. And when yeah. you started writing this film, no other films were kind of being made about that era at the time, but uh, before you finished, Hugo came <laughs> out and the artist, the artist came out. Yeah. Was that coincidental? It, it was coincidental. Um, and we were initially devastated because I put in close to a year and then suddenly we heard the artist came out and we, we watched it win. We loved it, we saw it and we loved it, but we I really was questioning, will this just seem a copycat? And uh, But inevitably, and some of my actors, I want to mention Jeffrey Von Meyer who played the boss. Now mm -hmm. he, he knew, like I had mentioned, I wrote four people specifically knowing that person will be great here and there. I think they wanted to play these roles. There he is on the right there, and Jeff, the boss. And we all decided eventually, well, our story is different enough. Yeah. It's a different era. The, the, the artist takes place during the end of the silent era, and this is during the middle, the beginning of the middle period of silent yeah. films when it was turning into art. And right. uh, uh, then Hugo came out, and I thought, well, good, maybe. And, you know, with Jeff's remind, he said, no, people are interested. And I said, okay, there can be two. You know, and, 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 and our style is different. And yeah. I made a two reeler, which is Chaplin and Laurel and Hardy. They made two reelers. It meant ten minutes a reel, basically. Yeah, we're twenty-two minutes, so it was a classic format. You know, we've got an audience full of independent yeah. filmmakers here. Can you talk about, or do you find any similarities between modern independent filmmakers and the uh, pioneers, pioneers of yesteryear? Well, through my <laughs> research which I love doing was I was reading about how movies were made now if you love movies and we all know and you, when you try to deal with the big business how frustrating the business can be compared to making a film and what was fun about reading about the pioneer days was how was opportunities it's not to say anybody could walk in and do it but there were opportunities Things were smaller. It was a smaller, you know, things were scaled down. There were less probably lawyers in the picture. Yeah. There were less contracts and handshakes and things like that. Um, the camera equipment, I find. They didn't we have were, unions yet either. No unions, which is, well, it was dangerous mm -hmm. too. But I want to point out the Canon camera that Bobby, we're working with the 5D right there. The lightweight cameras, when sound came in, it really set film visuals backwards because of these giant sound booths and synchronized sound. Towards the middle period of silent films, they had perfected visual storytelling and placement of camera, and they could tell a story without sound and dialogue with eyebrows and eyes and camera angles and visual language. All that went way backwards when sound came in, and what happened was, uh, you know, to serve to the public all these sound, they brought in a lot of stage people, and everything became dialogue driven, and the booths, everything was staged around the cameras. Well, these cameras that were affordable today for an independent filmmaker, a camera like a Canon 5D Mark II, we can make a pretty sophisticated movie today, and with a lightweight tripod suddenly that mobility is back and uh, a filmmaker can do that. Um, it doesn't take an entire corporate structure to make a film and, and that's what was going on with the pioneers. They would get a film, they, they, they had their obstacles for sure and they did deal with lawyers. The Edison people really had control over patents and things like that which is why the Hollywood ended up happening because the, the birth of the industry was back on the East Coast, New Jersey and Long Island, Brooklyn. And the Edison had a patent group of seven patent holders and they would send out Pinkertons to break up independent films and confiscate cameras and kind of rough people up. What, what, were, the, um, what were the patents on? I mean, if you could buy a camera, camera why movements, can't you use it? Camera movements. Are you kidding me? And film systems and they demanded that you pay them 
or you can't make a movie. And it's like then they started con filmmaking. Well, then they started controlling the content of your movie. In some cases, some required a a logo in every scene and things. So the independent minded, and then they took a large percentage of the profits. So the the true independents started moving west to get away from that yeah. and eventually they ended up in California figuring well we have good sunlight and year round we can make movies year round but we want they wanted to get as far away from all that and the laws changed right. you know they were antitrust that broke that up so I don't want to make a picture that our pioneer filmmakers had it easy they had yeah. all kinds of rough things that's going really on. interesting the thing that we have yeah. to remember is you, you couldn't fly across the United no, States in five hours it was a three or four day I saw, I saw a picture of early filmmaker, director Alan Dwan, who had a huge long career. But he's out in California making an early film, and he's got the Jodhapurs on, the riding boots, and he's wearing a pistol while he's directing. Because they were really, it was a lot more dangerous out here, and, <sighs> and he was protecting. I also think maybe he wanted to show some authority on the yeah. set. I don't know. <laughs> one I'm way to get your thinking about wearing a listen. pistol from now on. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. one way to get your yeah. actors to listen. Yeah. Well, we've got some really great audience questions. They okay. are um, very active on meeting Pulse and voting on each other's questions. The first one is, was it challenging to get your modern actors to adapt to a silent format? Well, there, were, there are challenges to acting in the silent, yeah, so with everything read, yes. Every one of the actors who came on did it because they really wanted that challenge. Yeah. So I had no, I mean, our the actors were delightful to work with. We restaged one or two scenes after filming them because I realized that's too dialogue heavy. Mm -hmm. heavy. And one was a line when uh, the director asked the comic about another actress, is she attractive? And initially it was a dialogue, yes, and this, and instead he did it with his hands, yeah. and he whistled, and it, it read in silent comedy. Mm -hmm. So we were just aware of it, and uh, it, it worked. What's your favorite episode of The Simpsons? Maybe each of you have an answer to that. Well, uh, I, I, one thing I could say is always it's the next one that Mark yeah. did. <laughs> there are a lot of them. I mean, we saw one just this past weekend it was quite wonderful and uh, but he he's drawn from on a lot of his experiences traveling with us in Africa and other places for example he had one in, in Africa and uh, they had written it in a way that was impossible and he had to ask for modifications because it couldn't have happened the way they were showing it on another occasion they went to Italy and Mark had been in Italy with Francoise and I and uh, that wasn't possible. So all of these, I love watching what he does with them. Uh, it's hard to think of a specific favorite because it's which of your children do you love the most? That's, that's like <laughs> do you have me. a child that you love the most? Um, well, I, I give you a couple. Of, one is one I'm about to direct. It's always oh, a good okay. way to be. But um, uh, it's one directed by... Well, David Silverman has done some beautiful ones, but they're ones by my coworkers, not my own. And yeah. uh, Rich Moore did one called Lisa's Substitute, and it's where Lisa falls in love with her substitute teacher and starts to see her dad as inadequate. And I love the <laughs> I love the heartfelt side to that yeah. story. There yeah. was an episode. Uh, I don't know if you directed this one or not. Um, that had Al Yankovic in it. I where, did direct that. Where uh, Homer yeah. Simpson says something to the effect of he who doesn't love Al Yankovic yeah. doesn't love or yeah. doesn't uh, is like no longer alive or something like that. that. I did direct that and that's when I met Al for the first time. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, we've got more questions from the audience. They want to know what powerful tools can actors learn from performing in silent films? I can tell you that when I first studied film with a great director Alexander McKendrick and Haskell Wexler by the way agrees with this you ought to be able to take a, a, a good movie, you ought to be able to turn the sound off and still get the story. And if people think visual, if actors think visual, mm -hmm. it's really 90% of the communication of the film. So That's good to know. Yeah. Do you believe a market could exist for telling modern stories using silent films? I think there's a market for good films, whether they're silent or, you know, as I've said, I have mentioned this before. That's a great question, by mm -hmm. the way. 
I if it's a if it's a bad silent film, it won't it won't work. But right. yeah, I think a good I think the artist is an example. It won Best Picture. Uh, they have a question for you, Dad. They say, uh, what behind the scenes moments do you feel are the most revealing about the people involved? For me, uh, obviously, I was very comfortable because they were shooting at Mark's home, and I know my way around there. <laughs> and uh, it was interesting. The first day, and when I arrived. Uh, I, w I watched the, the chaplain character, Adam, being made up, and he he started like a, a, a like a normal, interesting kind of a young guy, but he developed, he changed, and and suddenly he started to move differently, and and that was quite wonderful to observe that. Uh, again, seeing Al Yankovic, that uh, Yankovic, uh, do his role was amazing. I was very. A little nervous about it. I, can he carry this off? And you know, we are showing the Last Supper there. It justified my mind because this was had been done in a film before, and he did it brilliantly. And it's hard. I mean, you can understand why he is as well thought of as he is because he is quite a genius. Yeah. What's the favorite project you guys have worked on together? This film. Oh, <laughs> well, likewise. Oh, that's yeah. good. This yeah. film. This one, yeah. Great pride in yeah. Mark, and <laughs> he he did it with uh, it's, just a, I'm so pulling glad. up with his fingernails. Well, I'm so glad himself up. The, the team of people I was able to work with, and I think, you know, it, it's, it's, it's humor and it's fun, but it's also, it allowed me to make some comments about our industry that we work in and the, the joy of filmmaking and the heartbreak of filmmaking and uh, I, irony to the film which I think contributes to the humor is nothing is really changed. This mm. is like a fairy tale but you know you have business and problems and egos and 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 all kind and when things go bad on set and I, an inside joke with another filmmaker a friend of mine that I went to school with was that you're in trouble on set anytime somebody high up thinks you're making art. <laughs> and, 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 yeah. and the, you know, so yeah, that, yeah, that's why I was able to express a lot of that <laughs> in a humorous way. So, yeah, and you yeah. got to make art for yeah. yourself without well, anybody overseeing you. It, it was better. It, well, the joy of filmmaking for yourself, which is something um, I. You know, I've been lucky to make a living, number one. To make a living is great. To make a living in a form of art is even better. And then if you can control that art, it, it, it's even better on top of better. So I was able to do that. I think so. you mastered it, oh, Mark. Thank you. I think yeah. you mastered it. <laughs> oh, thank you, this is a really yeah. good question. I love this one. Um, the audience member asked, seeing silent films almost disappear, do you love hearing about the studios keeping Kodak film alive? I do. <laughs> <laughs> you probably could have really made yeah. this film without it. Also, Photochem keeping yeah. a film alive. Like I say, they're 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 onward into the digital world, but they help independent filmmakers with the with projects. They help me um, and others, and uh, it's because they love the medium and they respect the history. Yeah, so. it's good to know that those yeah. people still yeah. exist. There's uh, one last question from our audience, and they want to know, are there any similarities between filmmaking in 1914 and today? I think that's kind of similar to the yeah. question I asked before. Did you want to add to that? Well, I will just say the, the spirit of, and the desire to tell visual stories and movies uh, was strong in 1914, and it certainly is today. So uh, I think, yes. I think that it's uh, the today's independent filmmakers ha really are have a lot of the spirit of the pioneer filmmakers had in their hearts too. So I believe that. Well, I have one last question that I ask every filmmaker that comes on the show, and that is, um, you know, knowing that your journey's not over and how far that you've come. If you could look back and wish you had one lesson that you gained along the way. What would that one lesson be to share with our young filmmakers out in the audience? That's a really good question too, and summing it all up into one <laughs> question, we both should answer that one. But I, I would say, um, 
be passionate and study filmmaking is a huge art form. And I was thinking about it and said, everything you know can go into a movie. It, it can require. So educate yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, keep an open mind. That's something Haskell Wexler has also told me. I watched Haskell in front of, a, we showed this film at uh, Santa Monica City College in the film department. And he told all the, about 40 people, he said, you all have to figure out how to make a living so you can make films. And I think that's a really good idea. But it, to be a good filmmaker, I think you either be an innate genius or you practice a lot and do it. So I say do it. And with the tools today, especially Canon helping and, and people there, if you can, make films. Absolutely. And for me, yeah. I would just comment, I agree with everything Mark just said, but I also say, Find a destination, your optimum destination, see it, and then do everything you can to find your way to it. And in the, on the trip, you will have some ups and downs. But if you keep heading that way, you will make it. You can make it. And it, it, you need to assure yourself of that at times. And uh, that's certainly been very important in my career, and I know it has been in Mark's too, because uh, there's never any guarantee. The next, I mean, he's had a job in television for 25 mm -hmm. years. Most actors are lucky to have a job for 13 weeks, you know, <laughs> and that's how what a Three days. quarter of a century, make, and still going. And make film because you like, love it, yeah. and and, and if it's a lifestyle, and then you know, I I enjoy it so. I, I don't know if that's advice, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm so glad that yeah. we've been invited yeah. here Thank this you. evening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you have so many cool toys here. That one is my favorite from the movie. Can you show us how to use it? Sure. Uh, can you see it, everybody? This is a special camera. This is uh, a Bell and Howell 2709. It was designed in 1912. This actual camera was sold to a production company in Los Angeles in 1915 and has been making movies out here. Its last professional job was to shoot Al Yankovic. So, <laughs> but these are the original legs. Back then, you had a turret. This, by the way, was the first all-metal camera. It was designed because a, there were a filmmaking couple who had a wooden camera, which cameras before this were wood. They took it to Africa and it was eaten by termites. So this company said, we're going to make a metal camera. It's ingenious and it became, it set the standard for films of the silent era. This is a side finder. It had a system for focusing and composition where there's a little eyepiece. You have a turret for different focal lengths that you could, it spins. But through this eyepiece, I can line up my shot. First of all, the rack over method, this is what it means. There's a sliding bar here. The lens in the middle right here of this bar, and I look through here, I line up my focus and my composition, then, and it's lined up here. The film path is here. I then put this lens that I've focused over the film path, then I rack over the camera. I lock it down first. I rack it over, I slide it over. Then I'm preset up and I'm now looking through a side finder. I'm not looking through the lens. The technology didn't exist for through the lens photography until after World War II. Movies like Gone with the Wind were made with a side finder. So anyway, I'm locked up. And there's one other piece of equipment I want to show you that you had to have to operate a camera like this. OK, I'm going to lock it in position. You had to have this newsboy cap. <laughs> <laughs> they always had it. And very often, they're either like this, or they turned it behind like that. And then you would try, you're, you would try to turn this crank. It was very important that it was smooth, more important that you were steady and I'm still locking this tripod down. Sorry <laughs> about that. OK. Maybe it's a loose. But you would try to hit two revolutions a second. And that would give you 16 frames a second, which was the standard rate. 
So the cameraman of the day would get into a rhythm like this and they would try to stay steady and they would often hum songs like da 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 and that reminded them of this the speed rate. But right there they're you know that's a Bell and Howell 2709. So there you go. joining us today if you're inspired by what you heard in today's interview please be sure to subscribe to our youtube channel and the itunes podcast so you don't miss the next one on youtube we are wmm originals and if you click around the channel you won't just find how we make movies episodes but you'll also find editing tutorials original short films and sketches written and developed by the members of our collective in la and if you're in the la area look us up we meet every wednesday in hollywood and it's a great way to meet other cool filmmakers and get your stuff made i'll see you next time Thank <laughs> you.